Hey everybody, Dr. Davis here to talk to you a little bit about easy isomerism. Uh, we use this uh, system of nomenclature when we're dealing with alkenes which have certain groups attached to them which create multiple potential geometric arrangements. But before we look at some things that actually have easy isomerism, I want to show you a few things that don't. Uh, first of all, let's take a simple alkene in which we have one unique substituent and three that are exactly the same, indicated here by the green and white spheres. Now I can draw what may at first glance look like a different isomer, but remember our rule for being an isomer, that is that if I can rotate and translate these molecules to overlay them and make them appear identical, then they're not isomers, they're the same molecule. And I can in fact do this simply by rotating my new molecule. So you'll see that these are the same. If I go one level up in complexity, I add, let's say, two green substituents and two whites, again I can draw what may look like a uh, different set of, uh, of isomers here, but in truth all I have to do is rotate the molecule on the right and I've recreated the exact same molecule as on the left. So these don't have E, Z isomerism. Now the simplest situation in which we do have E, Z isomerism would be one like we we're showing below here. Now you'll see that I still have two green and two white substituents, but the difference here is that I have put them on alternating carbons. And so nothing that I d uh, do short of actually breaking that pi bond and rotating the carbon-carbon bond can cause them to be superimposed. They're clearly not the same molecule and no matter how I attempt to rotate my new construct I can't get it in a position where it looks exactly the same as the molecule on the left. So these are clearly different from one another and therefore they need different names because they will have different chemistry. And this is where the E Z isomerism nomenclature comes in. So our requirement here is that we have these alkene carbons which contain two distinct groups. You see that in my other examples where they were the same, I had at least one of my two alkene carbons having exactly the same group attached. So easy isomerism exists only when both alkene carbons have two distinct substrates each. Now let's take a look at an example. I'm going to try to name a couple of alkenes here using the easy isomerism uh, methodology, but before we do that I'm going to explain to you uh, how we go about identifying higher priority and lower priority groups. Now we have to do this because that's how we actually arrive at the designation of E or Z. In the case when the higher priority groups are on the same side of the alkene double bond, we call this a Z isomer. In the case where the higher priority groups are on opposite sides, we call this an E isomer. And these names come from uh, German words for same and opposite, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce because I will, uh, I will show you how bad my German is. But you can see here very clearly, Z means higher priority on the same side, E means higher priority on opposite sides. Now the last thing that we need to do before we can start actually naming some alkenes is to go through the kahn ingold prelog convention for defining which group is the highest priority. And in the case of naming alkenes, this all begins with recognizing the fact that we're only going to look at one half of the molecule at a time. So I'm going to dim half of my molecule and concentrate on only one side, that is one alkene carbon at a time. Once I've done this, I start with one of my alkene carbons and move one bond outward, comparing the atomic number of the atom that I encounter. If I reach an atom, which has a higher atomic number than its competitor, then we have a win and our contest is over regardless of what else is attached. If however there's a tie, we proceed one bond outward and we find the set of bonded atoms with the highest atomic numbers. So we're going to generate a list actually of three new atoms and whichever list contains the highest numbered atomic numbered atom is going to be our winner and therefore our higher priority substituent. After this, we'll do the opposite side of the molecule, and then we'll assign our E, Z. So let's do this now with a real molecule. Okay, so let's dive in here by trying to determine whether or not the molecule I've drawn for you is an E or a Z isomer. Now, I've given it to you in a skeletal structure, which is not uncommon. This is probably the way your professor will, will give you some of your uh, exam questions. But I find that in the case of determining easy isomers, it's always better to redraw the molecule in such a way that you have explicitly drawn the first few sets of bonds. And that's because you don't want to accidentally miscount, because that can throw you off completely. 
So let's start by determining which of the two groups on the left-hand side of this molecule is the higher priority group. I'm going to start from my sp2 carbon and work my way out one bond. When I do this, I see that I reach a carbon in both cases. Therefore, this situation is a tie, so I have not yet determined which of the two is the higher priority group. Therefore, I have to move out another bond. On the lower of the two groups, this gives me a list of atoms, C, H, H. On the upper of the two groups, the list of atoms that I get is H, H, H. As I line each of these groups up in order of decreasing atomic number, I immediately have a solution to my question. And that is that the carbon of the lower group makes it higher priority. So I'll put a green box around this to indicate that that's my higher priority group on this side. Next I'm going to do the same exercise for the opposite side of the molecule. Starting with the sp2 carbon and working my way out, I find first that we have a tie with carbons. So I've not yet settled the issue, so I have to move another bond out. Doing so on the lower group gives me a list of atoms in decreasing atomic number of C, H, H. Doing so at the top gives me a list of C, C, H. And now I start comparing my list from left to right. Carbon matches carbon, but carbon beats hydrogen. So I have determined a winner. I can now stop the process of determining which is the more important group. It's the one on top. So because I have determined that the most uh, uh, highest priority groups are at opposite sides of the double bond, I would call this an E isomer. Now let's take a look at one more example so that we can see how multiple bonds are, are handled when we use this con uh, method of determining priorities. So here I have another alkene, and I'd like to determine whether it's an E or Z isomer. So in order to do this, I'm going to go through the same exercise I did before. That is, starting with the left-hand sp2 carbon, I first find that I have a tie at my first atom with carbons. And as I move to the second atom in the lower group, it's relatively simple. My list is carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen. But as I do so for the top, I have a double bond to a carbon, which means that I need to count that as two carbon atoms, even though one carbon atom only really exists. So when I do this and compare my list, I have carbon facing carbon, and then I have carbon over hydrogen. So I've determined that the higher priority of my two groups is the one on top. And of course, for the right-hand side, we'd go through the exact same exercise that we did in the previous example, moving out one bond to find that carbons are tied, and then moving out a second bond in the lower group to give us a list of atoms of C, H, H. Doing so in the top gives us, again, C, C, H. And by comparing these lists, we can determine our winner. So in this case, both of the more important substituents are at the top, the higher priority substituents, that is. And therefore, we would call this a Z isomer. Now, there are many more complex examples of how this type of nomenclature can be applied. And so you'll want to continue working through the problems in your book to be sure you understand all of the potential gotchas and nuances of using this naming system. But this is good enough to get you started. So uh, have fun uh, naming your ENZ isomers, and uh, I'll see everybody next time.